Anyway, it is uh, it is great to be here at the Northgate Retreat, even though uh, I'm some 1,800 miles away and uh, everyone is listening from the comfort of their own home in their living rooms there. So uh, it would have been great to have been able to be at, uh, at the camp, at Lakeside Camp, but uh, circumstances have made it so that uh, things are a bit different this year. Um, but that is okay. That is okay. Let me start. What, what I would like to talk about um, tonight, tomorrow night, also on Sunday morning, um, I'd like to talk about this uh, uh, topic of revival in the midst of crisis. The, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. But the fear of coronavirus is the beginning of hysteria, and we've seen that all around us. Uh, we are prepared more for the coming of more concerned about the pandemic of coronavirus. Polls on Facebook and in the news about coronavirus than we have read chapters of our Bibles. We have talked to our friends more about coronavirus than we have talked to them about Christ. And then, as far as hand washing goes, I have never washed my hands this much ever in my life. I'm absolutely amazed at how obsessed we are with keeping clean. We, we as a nation, have never washed our hands so much or so often. This may be dispensers are everywhere. So careful about what we touch. Uh, I never, ha I haven't been this careful anyway. It, it, so your hands are clean. That, that's very good. I ask you, how's your heart? How's your soul? How are you as you stand before your maker? Uh, are you clean spiritually speaking? Hebrews 10, 22 says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that brings faith, that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. In James chapter four, verse eight, it says, come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And obviously, it's not talking about washing your hands with hand sanitizer. Uh, washing our hands, spiritually speaking. A and then thinking about the economy in the midst of this crisis. The stock market has crashed. Businesses are closing. Revenue is lost. People can't go to work. Some of you that are listening maybe have lost your jobs temporarily. Uh, we're seeing the beginning of a, of a huge economic crisis. Hysteria, there's fear, stockpiling, price gouging, even toilet paper hoarding is all around us. We are witnessing how easily and how quickly this fragile world can spiral downward. Maybe this is a foreshadowing of things to come. Things like this will happen in the Great Tribulation, but it's going to be way worse than this in the Great Tribulation. You ain't seen nothing yet. And obviously, I'm not saying that we're in the Great Tribulation. I do not think that this is the Great Tribulation. The Tribulation will be much worse than this, but it's like the beginning of birth pains. And you see how fragile this world is and how the Lord can just snap his fingers and the next day this whole world is in desperate need searching so those days of the great tribulation they may be very far off still but what we're experiencing now is nothing compared to that future event and then also you so so just kind of thinking about the fear the, the hand washing the economic crisis and, and now talking about the the moral responsibility that we all have coronavirus ha has caused us all to think about our moral responsibility toward the world around us listen just a month ago people were saying there are no moral absolutes you do you and I'll do me. Just don't push your morals on others. Don't push your morals on me. People say that all the time. And it sounds really good, right? And then coronavirus happens. And all of a sudden, everyone is saying, you have a moral responsibility to abide by certain rules for the good of everyone around you. 
wow, what a change in philosophy. All of a sudden, we're getting these morals pushed on us, a moral responsibility to wash your hands, to self-quarantine, uh, to practice social distancing, all of that, this, these moral, uh, this moral responsibility, uh, which just a couple of two months ago, a month, ago uh, people were saying don't push your morality on me and all of a sudden now everyone sees that this is a, a good thing to push certain morals on others so how should we understand tragedy how should christians understand tragedy how do we respond to evil and suffering in our world what do we think when calamity strikes if god exists why doesn't he uh, just get rid of coronavirus? If God really exists, why does he allow coronavirus to ravage the world? If, if he's good, he'd get rid of it. And if he's all powerful, he could get rid of it, right? Those are the questions that can be asked about all suffering and evil in this world around us. And these, these are the questions that have been asked down through the ages. For, for millennium, these questions have been asked. Uh, why doesn't God just get rid of all the pain and evil around us? And the answer is, he will. Just not yet. Just not yet. Think about it. If God took all the suffering out of the world right now, He'd have to take sin out, too, because sin is what brings suffering. And if he took the sin out of this world, he'd have to take you out also because you're a sinner. You're part of the problem. But in God's great mercy, he's giving you time to come to him. Now, right now I'm speaking to the unbeliever. And as a Christian those of you brothers and sisters in Northgate that are listening, you can use that as you're talking to people around you uh, about crisis moments like this and sin and suffering in the world and coronavirus. Why does God allow this? And really, uh, God in his great mercy, he's giving you time to repent and come to faith in Christ. Um, you are broken. I am broken. The nations are broken. The environment is broken. Pandemics happen. Financial crisis, political unrest, mass shootings, uh, fires, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, terrorism, racism, social injustices. The world wasn't created to, to work this way. It wasn't created to function like this. We live in a broken world. These things are all a result of sin. This is just what happens in a fallen world. Coronavirus happens in a fallen world. Financial crisis happens in a fallen world. Suffering is part of our broken world, and the brokenness exists because we're all sinners. Bad things happen in a fallen world. Really, a, a better question would be, Instead of asking, why do these bad things happen? A better question would be, why has God shown me so much mercy so as to preserve my life until now? Or, or maybe to put it this way, why do good things happen to bad people? God is gracious. You're living on borrowed time. If you and I make it to the end of the day, it's purely by his grace. Jesus always makes it personal. And you see this in Luke chapter 13, verse 5. He's talking to these guys who come to him with this atrocity that has happened in the local news at the time. And, and, and Jesus, he, he says, unless you repent, you too will perish. It, that's the bottom line. The prophets came preaching, repent. Jesus came preaching, repent. Before him, John the Baptist came preaching, repent. Uh, the disciples afterwards preached repent down through the ages. It, preachers have always preached repent. Heaven is closed to the unrepentant. There is an incredible urgency for us to come to repentance. If not now, when? Coronavirus is warning us all. Repent while there's still time. Now, this is where, so that kind of as an introduction, I just wanted to kind of present the crisis. And all of you know this very well. You've read the news. Everyone is up on coronavirus. We, maybe many of you know how many have, uh, according to the news and the 
statistics. How many have died today because of coronavirus? So you're all up on that. But I mean, the, all of the, the hand washing and the fear and the, um, the the economic crisis, all of this all around us. Listen, times of crisis should push us to revival. And revival really is dependent on the people of God repenting. Yes, it, unbelievers need to repent and come to faith in Christ. But it is really surprising from God's word, you see that God really directs his word toward his people. In 1 Peter, it talks about judgment must begin with the people of God. And you see it in the Old Testament also where God, he really begins his judgment with Israel. And so that famous verse, and many of you have heard it mentioned, it's been thrown around a lot in these days of, of, of uh, pandemic. But uh, I want to touch on this verse, and I really kind of want to give an outline and, and talk about some of these things that are mentioned here in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. This famous verse, actually, I'm going to start in 13, and I'm going to go 13, 14, and 15. Look at this. If I send pestilence, viruses, if I send coronavirus among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. Now, I am well aware some of you are thinking, Micah, that is an Old Testament verse. It is for Israel. You're ripping it out of context. Uh, I understand. Yes, this verse, it is given to Israel. But can we not apply some of the things that are taught, especially in that verse 14, uh, maybe the Lord is not going to heal our land uh, and our land. Obviously, this verse is talking about the land that was given to Israel. But at the same time, we see in First Corinthians chapter 10, I think it's verse six, where it says that the things that happened to Israel happened as an example for us to learn from that example. So we ought to learn from the example in the Old Testament. And we can take a verse like this and apply many things to us. Yes, re recognizing we aren't Israel. But listen, I, I want to touch on a couple of things here. Number, number one, God sends pestilence sometimes. Uh, according to this verse, I mean, you may balk at those words in verse 13, God sends pestilence. What? Yes, in the Bible, there's actually, there's so many examples of this. In the Bible, there are plenty of instances where God sends his judgment on the wicked and sometimes on his people when, when they uh, veer from where they should be. In Genesis chapter 6, you see that God sent a flood on the entire world. Uh, later in Genesis chapter 19, God sends fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. In Exodus 7, chapter 7 through chapter 11, God sends plagues on Egypt plague after plague after plague on Egypt. In Numbers chapter 21, God sent fiery serpents among his people, among the Israelites. In 1 Samuel chapter 5, God sent tumors on the Philistines. In 2 Kings chapter 17, God sent lions to kill some of the people in Samaria. The book of Joel deals with kind of the story of a, of a locust plague coming upon the land and ravaging the land of Judah. In the book of Revelation, we see that God will, in the future, send plague after plague after plague after plague on the earth. Throughout the Bible, we see certain times when God's anger is unleashed. These are warnings to us in the year 2020. We have been warned that God may send pestilence, viruses among his people if they persist in wickedness. Um, another thing that I want to point out here is if the USA wants survival, we need revival. 
if we want survival, and I'm not saying that that coronavirus is going to wipe out the country. This this may be just the beginning of birth pains. Uh, uh, this may be gone in, in a couple of weeks. Uh, but the Lord, he can judge a nation in a split second. And we need revival desperately in our country. If the USA wants to see survival, we must see revival. Maybe God is chastening our nation with coronavirus. I don't I don't know. I'm not going that far to say that. But definitely, this is a wake-up call. The only way to make America great again is through humility, through prayer, through repentance. It is time for America to make a choice. Which way will you go, America? Which do you choose? Revival or ruin? Wake up. We need to wake up. God has sent us a wake up call and it's called COVID-19. The alarm is sounding forth. The United States needs to turn to the Lord while there's still time. Revival is the only answer. Uh, I plead with each one of you that are listening right now that you seek personal revival. National revival starts with personal revival. In 2 Chronicles 7.14, this verse that we're looking at, we see God's blueprint for revival. We see his conditions for revival, his ingredients, recipe, the plan, the path, the prescription, the formula, the keys, the terms, the, the way to revival, any way that you want to put it. The way to revival is found in this verse 14. Humble yourself, number one. Number two, pray. Number three, seek God's face. And number four, repent. And once again, God is saying this to his people. Yes, he's speaking to Israel at the time of the Old Testament. But are we not his people, the church today? We are his people. And so he says to his people, pray, seek God's face, humble yourself, repent. He's speaking to God's peace, speaking to his people. So the opposite of those four things are the enemies to revival. The four things that rob us of, of revival are pride, prayerlessness, apathy, ongoing sin. These are why we don't see God move today. Uh, I'm, I'm convinced of that. God doesn't move today because we're lacking in those four areas. That's why revival tarries. So if, if we were to start something called the 714 Initiative, based in this verse the 714 initiative we can and should take these principles from this verse second chronicles 714 and apply them to our present situation humble yourselves pray seek god's face turn from your wicked ways this is the only road to recovery I send out a call for humility, for prayer, for repentance. Repentance always comes before blessing. We cannot see renewal without revival. And we cannot see revival without repentance. Return to God. This is the only way to open heaven. It's the only way to open God's eyes and his ears and his heart. It's time to seek God's face. Once again, I, I read these verses, starting in verse 13. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locust to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive those, their sin, and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. Listen, we have insulted God. We have insulted God Almighty. We need His mercy. Look at the sin of our nation. Uh, abortion, homosexuality, adultery, drugs, sex trafficking, gangs, alcoholism, materialism, pornography, evolution. We are rotting in wickedness. 
And to make things worse, the USA has become the greatest exporter of wickedness in the world. It, it, through all of the, the, the Hollywood and the movies and all the junk and pornography that is, is filmed here in this country and sent out abroad. The matter is not right or left. The matter is right or wrong. I don't want to be a pessimist. No, I'm a glowing optimist. I'm an optimist. I'm an opti I'm optimistic that America will repent and that there will be a revival here in these last days. America will come to Christ. That's what I'm praying, that America will be saved. But if we don't hasten toward repentance, then I'm afraid that coronavirus is just the beginning of birth pains. So uh, looking at this verse, uh, 2 Chronicles 7.14, once again, you can divide that up into four points. It's very easy to see. Number one, the people God has. Number two, the pride God hates. Number three, the prayer that God hears. And number four, the promise God honors. Number one, the people God has. Once again, emphasizing this, this is written, uh, this is written to God's people Israel in the Old Testament, but definitely applies to his people of the New Testament, the church, the universal church and uh, the people of God. Uh, it, it, he's talking to the people of God. And so really, I think that uh, if, if this world uh, goes further and further down the slippery slope of ruin, um, to some extent, it's the church's fault. If America falls, it, it will be, uh, um, I uh, kind of say this uh, 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 with fear and trepidation, uh, but if America falls, it will be, to a certain extent, the church's fault. It's not our duty to persuade God to bring revival. No, we must permit him to do so. Because judgment begins with the house of God. That, that's 1 Peter 4, 7. I made reference to that earlier. But the hope of America is not in the White House or in the schoolhouse or in the courthouse. The hope of America is in God's house. It's got to start with the Christians. If revival is going to begin, it's got to begin with us, the people of God. Can you honestly say, I'm desperate for God? Do you have a hunger and a thirst for God? Do you have a hunger and thirst for righteousness? Can you say, I'm desperate for revival? I, I think that a lot of us don't, don't feel that urgency. We, we don't feel the urgency of the hour. And, and, and it's the sad thing that we don't feel this urgency. And I really think that's why revival can't come. Because the church, the people of God, don't feel that sense of urgency for revival in, in their own lives. They don't feel that in their churches and for their neighborhoods, for our communities, for our states, for our country. We can blame everyone else and everything else for the sin in our land and all the wickedness. But God points at his people. You've lost your passion for the glory of his name. You've lost your passion for evangelism. You've lost your passion for Bible reading and prayer. You've lost your passion for personal holiness. Where is the earnestness? What will it take? What has to happen to wake us up as a church in the United States of America? Is coronavirus enough? Or does God have to send more viruses? Uh, maybe war? Uh, more financial crisis. What does he have to do to wake the church up? And, and so this verse in, in, uh, in verse 14, it starts, if my people, if my people, he's talking to his people. This is a big if. It depends to a certain extent on the people of God. And if the people humble, if his, his people humble themselves. So point number two here, the pride that God hates. We are to humble ourselves. Don't pray, God, humble us. I don't think that we should do that. I don't, I don't think that that would, I don't think we really want God to humble us. Uh, don't pray, God, to humble us. No, humble yourself. That's what it says in the book of James. Uh, you know why we don't pray? It's because we're proud. 
I, I know this from my own experience. Uh, I'm just, I'm too strong. Uh, I depend on myself rather than running to God in times of need or even when there isn't a time of need. But just running to God, it shows humility. It, we are humbling ourselves when we come to God asking Him for help. Or, or, or just simply running to him to be in, to, in his presence. It shows humility. Um, because we're proud, we don't pray. We don't pray because we don't humble ourselves. In James, James chapter 5, it's that famous ver verse, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And, and I think that God is resisting the, the proud churches of America, uh, we just need to come to a point where we are humbled before God. And he tells us to humble ourselves. So point number three, the prayer that God hears. First, it was the people God has. Then the, the pride that God hates. And now the prayer that God hears. C.H. Spurgeon, that... Uh, famous uh, preacher in England some 200 years ago or so, uh, quite possibly the greatest preacher since the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, C.H. Spurgeon said these words, prayer pulls the rope below and the great bell rings above in the ears of God. Some scarcely stir the bell for they pray so languidly. Others give but an occasional pluck at the rope, but he he who wins with heaven is the man who grasps the rope boldly and pulls continuously with all his might. Listen, God doesn't hear every prayer. There are some qualifications here. He hears the prayer that seeks his face, the prayer that turns from wickedness. We aren't seeking God's face. A lot of times I think we're seeking God's hand. The gospel in the United States of America has become more of like, what can God give me? And so we're looking at God's hand and what God can hand out rather than seeking his face. This verse says, pray and seek his face. We're just seeking what he can give us oftentimes. And we're not seeking him as a person. Listen, God is our only hope. Yes, God is our only hope. But you might not want to hear what I'm going to say now. God is our only hope, but also God is also our biggest threat. He's our nation's biggest threat. Not terrorists, not coronavirus, not financial crisis or, or the stock market crumbling before our eyes. Our biggest threat is God. We sing God bless America while we abort millions of babies. We sing God bless America while sodomy struts down our streets. 969 times the word repentance is used in the Bible. Repentance is more than a conviction of sin. Paul, he preached to Felix, and Felix trembled, it says, but we never read that he comes to Christ in, in repentance and turning from sin. Pharaoh, he confessed his sin. You see this in Exodus 9.27. He, he says, I confess, I, I repent of my sin. But when the storm went away, so does his, his conviction. The conviction that came in the storm disappeared in the calm. I wonder what will happen as soon as coronavirus goes away. I wonder if there'll still be that urgency, that searching that we see in so many people around us. I'm not asking if you are sorry for your sin. I'm asking if you will turn from your sin. Repentance is a turning from our sin. It is not only a heart change, it's a wholehearted change. Not only broken over our sins, but also broken from our sins. America will perish if she doesn't repent. And so the fourth point coming from that verse 14, the promise God honors. So we, we've seen the people God has, the pride God hates, the prayer that God hears. And now lastly, the promise God honors, the promise God honors. 
if we humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and repent, then God promises, he promised Israel that he would hear from heaven, forgive our sins, their sins, and heal their land. God has promised to do this. He can send revival to our world today in the year 2020. I am so excited about the possibility. Just, I mean, can you imagine seeing worldwide revival on a worldwide level, just a turning to God? And, and, and it takes crisis moments like what we're facing right now. I thank the Lord for coronavirus and, and the crashing of the stock market and the loss of all these jobs. And I know, I'm sorry, some of you have been greatly affected by this. But maybe it's what we need. It's what the world needs to push us. Crisis moments push us toward God. The same God that sent revival to Israel in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. The same God that sent revival to Nineveh in the days of Jonah. The same God that sent revival to Jerusalem in the days of Pentecost. The same God who sent revival to America and Europe during the days of the Great Awakening in the 17th century. That same God could do it again if, if his people seek him and repent. We have an opportunity. This could be the church's finest hour. We need a church on fire. Who cares about making America great again? We need to make the church great again. This is a call to fall. A call to fall on our knees. I give you an invitation to reconciliation. An invitation to restoration. An invitation to renewal. But we have to go back to this important word. If. Two letters. Small little word. But there is tremendous importance in this little word, if. Everything that follows in this verse 14 hinges on that little word, if. If God's people humble themselves, if we want revival, it's got to come on God's terms. Listen, this is war. We are in a spiritual war. As Christians... We were not made to live like most men. And I know this is going to sound radical, the things that I'm going to say right here, but in these times of crisis and speaking about revival, I just, I'm going to be straightforward about some of these. I'm writing to myself. These are the things that I've written down that I want to preach to myself. As Christians, we were not made to live like most men. We were made to fight. We were made to strive. We were made to work, to conquer, to give ourselves for something that is eternal. Adam was given the command to bring everything into submission, to bring everything into harmony with the will of God. Now we live in a fallen world that lives in darkness and death and disconnection. The situation is dire. The situation is serious. The kingdom of darkness has spread throughout the whole planet. We are not called to play video games. We are not called to sit in front of a TV. We are not called to give ourselves to stupid little things that don't matter. We are called to advance a kingdom. To fight for him. Fight with a passion. And then... Only every once in a while, drop our swords and look up for a smile. I want to fight. I, I don't want comfort. I don't want ease in Zion. Because the kingdom of God is built, not by those who rest easily, but by those who go out into the streets and fight. They fight the Lord's battles. They fight against giants. They take on the Philistines of our day. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty to take down strongholds, fortresses. Our weapons are fervent prayer, the bold preaching of the gospel, and sacrificial love. Those are our, our weapons. Men, especially the men I'm preaching to you, rise up. Men need to rise up, O oh, men of God. Do what you were called to do. 
be valiant, to be strong, and know that it is going to cost you. It may cost you everything. It, you take your stand alongside our commander and king, the king, Lord Jesus. And then you face the devil who comes at you from without and he comes at you from within. And don't be surprised at the battle raging all around you. This is what happens in war. There's a battle. We're in the middle of a battle. You can't be surprised when, when battle happens around you. Our great God has given us a great commission. That commission is to make his name great while taking the gospel to everything that moves. There are people out there that do not worship our great God. There are places where our Lord Jesus is not worshipped. I cannot sleep because there are places where Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not worshipped. There is a place where the flag of Zion does not fly. We were made to wave that flag even in the worst places on the planet. That's what we were made for. We are to set aside our little temporal causes and give ourselves to this one great battle. You read the book of Acts and you see that all God did was send some men filled with the Holy Spirit. And these men, they turned the world upside down. It, it wasn't because of their cool haircuts or awesome tattoos or hip music. It was because they were men who had God's hand on their life. The hardest thing in the world to get is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's also the easiest thing in the world to lose. If the Holy Spirit left our churches, you wouldn't even know it in a lot of churches. We would go on just like nothing ever even happened. Same programs, same ministries. Wouldn't even know that the Holy Spirit was gone in a lot of churches. We need revival. We need revival. We need an awakening, but we cannot expect the Holy Spirit to just come and clean up our mess. We have clear direction from God in his word of what we are to do. We, we cannot expect God to move if we refuse to reform our own lives and live by what we read by the script in the scriptures. We've got to live by what we read in the scriptures. Revival is not an event. It's a lifestyle. Revival is not an event. It's a lifestyle. Let me end now by just reading you a couple of quotes. And, and I know that I've probably read this to some of you before. Uh, so bear with me. I think it's such a great quote. It's by a man named Lawrence Tribble. And he said this. This is, uh, I think, written in the 16th century or maybe 17th century. He says this. One man wakes, awakens another. Second one wakes his next door brother. Three awake can rouse a town and turn the whole place upside down. Many awake will cause such a fuss. It will awake all of us. One man wakes with dawn in his eyes. Surely then it multiplies. So once again, you see in, in these words right here, national revival starts with personal revival. One man wakes with dawn in his eyes. Surely then it multiplies. So I ask you, where are you personally? Each one of you as individuals that are listening right now, where are you at with the Lord? Do you need personal revival? I know that I constantly, I mean, it's a daily, a daily thing. I need to daily uh, look for revival in my own life as I, I seek the Lord and pray and read his word and try to go about using the gifts and abilities that the Lord has given to me and get into battle and praying, Lord, I need personal revival. One man wakes, awakens another. Second one wakes his next door brother. Three awake can rouse a town and turn the whole place upside down. Let's pray that the Lord would use us to turn this world upside down as we are in the midst of crisis. But crisis is the very thing that pushes us towards revival, which we so badly need. Let me give one more quote right here. Um, and this is from John Wesley. Give me 100 men who fear nothing but sin in their own lives and want no one but God and God alone. 
I care not whether they be clergymen or laymen. They will shake the gates of hell and set up God's kingdom upon earth. Just give me a few good men that fear nothing in this world except for sin in their own life. Fear that. It will render you useless. And then after that, want nothing in this world but God and God alone. God can use men like that. Oh, I pray that the Lord would raise up men and women with a tremendous desire to see personal revival that would spread into national revival. So, uh, revival in the midst of a crisis. So, I'm done right there. I will pray now uh, to to end this message. I don't know if uh, we'll continue on there. Uh, I think there's going to be a question or a a time where people can discuss. There's some questions to talk about. Um, But uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we pray. We desperately pray that you would uh, revive us. Lord, revive me. Uh, We want you, uh, through the power of your Holy Spirit and through the power of your word, to set our hearts on fire, uh, a new and fresh zeal for the greatness of your name. Lord, we pray that you would help us to stand on your word. Help us, Lord, to seek your face. Lord, those those four keys in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, of humbling ourselves, praying, seeking your face, and turning from our wicked ways. Lord, you're speaking to your people. Uh, revival, it's got to, got to begin with the house, with your house. Discipline, it's got to start with the church. So, Lord, we pray that you would do great things today, in the year 2020, uh, even this month, in the month of April. Lord, we pray that you would do great things. Um, we thank you for the opportunity to have this uh, retreat, even though it's uh, virtual and uh, we're all gathered uh, from different places and uh, in our living rooms or basements, wherever they may be at home. But, uh, Lord, we pray that you would encourage us and that uh, you would inspire us to, to seek you diligently. In Jesus' name, amen.